started a series of talks and uh, yeah, something approaching workshops on the peer-to-peer, -peer, the peer-to-peer -peer web, uh, for which there is a huge community in Berlin that is somewhat akin to that of hackers and designers in Amsterdam. Uh, and he's here to talk about peer-to-peer -peer technology, but also the whole, uh, well, community manifestation of it. And maybe as one of those alternatives that has been addressed implicitly in the previous talks. Louis. Cool. Thank you very much. Um, do we need to do a mic check, or is, is this cool? I'm not. OK, cool. <laughs> Sweet. Um, I know everyone here is like really restless and really anxious and everything, so I'm going to try and like rip through as much as I can as quickly as I can. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for, for having me tonight. And it's a real privilege to be hanging out here in Amsterdam this evening. Um, Thank you to everyone who's been involved with organizing tonight's event. This has been really fun. So um, <clears throat> my name's Lewis. Uh, I live in Berlin. I write software for a living. And uh, the focus of a lot of my work is to do with the web, so uh, tools and applications for web browsers. And lately, a lot of my work has gravitated towards topics of like decentralization and peer-to-peer -peer publishing. So more specifically, I'm really quite interested in uh, what the future of web browsers that support like many different peer-to-peer -peer protocols looks like. Um, I think that is a near future. We're not far away from it. So I spend a lot of time tinkering with new protocols and figuring out how to try and do interesting things with them. So for some real world context, um, there's a couple of projects that I'm involved with right now that we're trying to explore some of these possibilities. So one collaboration is with a research group called Terra Zero. Their latest project's called Flower Tokens. Um, we're actually launching this on Monday. Uh, and so Flower Tokens is an experiment around the tokenization of something like a plant or a flower. So the, the Terra Zero crew, they've installed this flower wall at Trust, which is a uh, community, uh, community space in Berlin uh, that myself and Terra Zero and a lot of our friends hang out at and collaborate on different projects from. And so at Trust, there's uh, like a live streaming rig and a computer vision setup that monitors and tracks each of these hundred flowers and what they're doing. And so users can like uh, buy and trade them using peer-to-peer -peer money. So at uh, a larger scale, the question is like what uh, what might an autonomous forest look like? How would that work? But for a core component of like this particular experiment, now it's like how do users interact with these semi-autonomous things using like a peer-to-peer -peer web browser? Um, I also recently started working at a small platform cooperative, which is called Resonate. They're exploring ideas of how to build uh, a fair, equitable, user and artist owned music streaming platform that could eventually be entirely driven by a peer-to-peer -peer web technology. Uh, and a smaller, slightly inactive project now that I'd really like to pick up again soon, which a lot of people seem to know me through, is this thing called Hypercast and its original incarnation, Hypervision, which was, um, is this cool? Okay, cool, sweet. I'm trying to do my best radio voice, so that's cool. Um, so uh, this was a, a small experiment in like playing around with live peer-to-peer -peer video streaming with no central server um, using the DAT protocol, which I'll discuss very shortly. So as a result of all of that experimentation, back in February, I ended up starting a small regular event series at Trust, which is called Peer-to-Peer -peer Web. And um, it's really focused on introducing new creative audiences to accessible topics around like peer-to-peer -peer networking and peer-to-peer -peer publishing. We don't try to be overly technical, and we don't try to be overly academic in our approach. And a lot of the series was actually inspired by two specific tools. One is called uh, DAT, D-A-T, which is a peer-to-peer -peer protocol. Um, the other is an open source application, which is called Beaker. Um, it's a peer-to-peer -peer web browser that's actually built on top of the DAT protocol. So I made friends through that community, and what we all really subjectively agreed upon was that this um, specific tool set was the most um, interesting and, more importantly, most accessible way to introduce like new audiences to what the next big iteration of the internet might look like, um, one in which the browser actually is the user's platform rather than simply being uh, like a window into another company's platform. So over the next 15 minutes or so, I'd really like to try and do three things. The first is to very briefly explain how some of these tools work um, and how they might be similar to something that you've all used before. 
The second is to try and discuss why people might be interested in these tools as usable alternatives to like a platform driven internet. Uh, the third thing is that I want to briefly talk about ideas that we've discussed at Trust back in Berlin about like knowledge sharing through peer to peer networks, uh, how that may potentially link back into the topic of this evening's program. So I think that as a baseline, um, a lot of people here may already have some understanding of what it could mean to be P2P, um, how P2P networks relate to information distribution, for example. So the classic example of P2P is BitTorrent. Many of us here would have either downloaded or shared like movies or records through this protocol. So the idea is that someone publishes some data, someone announces that they want that data, the network finds peers that have that data, and then the protocol connects those peers together. Um, so as more users join, the network grows, uh, and peers continue distributing those files between each other. Um, there's an, an immediate sense of resilience and decentralization as a result of that topology. So the DAT protocol is actually incredibly similar to something like BitTorrent. So with DAT, someone publishes data, someone announces that they want data, the network finds peers with that data, and then the protocol connects those peers together. The most fundamental difference between DAT and BitTorrent, which are almost virtually the same, is that BitTorrent, when you create a, a torrent of, say, like a file or a folder of files, when you begin sharing that with other users, you can't actually make changes to that data. Um, because if you do, BitTorrent will actually boot you out of that swarm and won't let you share that data anymore. So the outcome is actually, well, that specific outcome is actually very useful for a lot of different scenarios uh, with certain technical requirements. But when you're wanting to share data with like many different users and you want to make lots of different changes to that data over like a period of time and have everyone receive those changes as they happen, uh, a protocol like DAT would allow you to do this. So it's because of that key difference that peer-to-peer -peer web browsers like say Beaker, which I mentioned before, have adopted those protocols like DAT for peer-to-peer -peer website distribution. Um, websites are often just simply like collections of files um, that change over a long period of time. Uh, so rather than users connecting to a central server, say like medium.com or facebook.com or Tumblr, to obtain those files, um, users should actually be able to distribute them amongst each other directly from their browsers like you would with BitTorrent. So uh, in Beaker's case, this is a screenshot of Beaker, um, the browser almost becomes like its own file system. Um, and it's a file system that you let other users access and like share on your behalf. So peer-to-peer -peer website distribution isn't actually a new idea, but because uh, Beaker treats itself like a file system, it also provides a really accessible tool set for you to create and maintain websites and documents on that peer-to-peer -peer file system. So traditionally, you would have this kind of uh, network topology where users upload files to central servers. Um, servers are actually like really complex, tricky things to set up. Um, I don't really know how to do that myself either, so publishing is like really fucking hard. Um, so this is why we have platforms to facilitate all of that bullshit for us. But when the user's browser actually becomes the server, you know, the initial distribution point itself, those power dynamics start to change. So it's then easier and actually more logical at that point to publish websites from your browser uh, rather than through a centralized server or a third party platform. So this is where the potential and a lot of optimism around this topic of the P2P web comes from. Um, so in addition to this, by using such a protocol, users can actually take advantage of three features that I think are very unique to P2P website networks. Um, I've tried to put some videos in here, so hopefully this will work. This is, this is Beaker. This is actually an old version of Beaker, but I'll, I'll let this run as I talk. So the first thing that we can do is actually go back and see any previous iteration of a peer-to-peer -peer website. So um, for example, the DAT archive format actually keeps track of every change that an author has made to their website so the user can go back in time and actually view any specific iteration of the web page right back to its initial genesis. So websites can even link directly to a particular iteration of another website through the URL 
Um, you know, this is what a website like archive.org is doing, but it's actually built into the data itself. Um, yeah, so. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's actually built on the same type of uh, file data structure that something like a GitHub repo would be. Um, we can probably discuss that a bit later if you want to ask those specific questions. Um, you'll actually see that in this URL bar here at the very end, we can actually specify which iteration of this archive we want using like a plus five or a plus one. We link directly back to that iteration. This was when nothing actually existed in the archive in the first place. So the second is that um, websites and applications can actually also be cloned, uh, remixed, uh, and republished back to the network by other users. Um, the technical term for this is called forking. Uh, and sites and web apps or like things that exist on the P2P web are infinitely forkable um, because they're all just files. So when you see something you like, but you would like to tweak it slightly for your own use case, this kind of stuff is actually quite trivial with a P2P web browser. Um, so this may not be super self-explanatory, but what we've actually just done here is we've had one website, we've created a fork of it, and now we have a copy of that website at a unique address that we own that we can then modify, change, and update in any way that we want. Um, the third and probably uh, my favorite feature of peer-to-peer -peer protocols is that data can be uh, shared across any type of network. So you don't have to be explicitly using quote-unquote the internet. Uh, you can distribute, in this case, uh, websites that we're talking about across like local networks, mesh networks, directly between users connected with an, uh, an ethernet cable or like a Bluetooth connection, as long as a computer can talk to another computer in some kind of fashion, a peer-to-peer -peer protocol should still allow you to send files to that other user. So in this case, the DAP protocol doesn't actually require the internet to access a website or a web app. There are lots of different options. Um, so to kind of like round off the technical bit, I did a much more extensive talk specifically about DAT and Biku browser several months ago, um, which really focuses on how creative communities specifically and artists can use peer-to-peer -peer browsers like Beaker to extend their creative practices. Um, so there's only so much about those tools that I can squeeze into this talk. Um, I suggest that if you're very new to this, you want to know more about Beaker as a publishing tool, more about forking and how websites can like mutate on the peer-to-peer -peer web. This particular video is a very good starting point. This is a website that you can use to get to that video archive. This is the website for the, the events and meetups that we do back in Berlin. Um, there's a really extensive and growing resource of peer-to-peer -peer web stuff at this particular website that I actually just came across the other day. It's called peer-to-peer -peer forever or p2p forever.org. Um, it looks super pretty as well, so go take a look at it. Um, I think next Friday, Andre, is it next Friday? The workshop? Yep, cool. So next Friday, there's actually also a workshop that Andre and Marcel are running as a part of this Summer Academy. Um, it's an introduction specifically to the DAP protocol through like a multiplayer text vector style game that they've built. And I'm really bummed that I'm going to miss that. But if you're really curious to dive further into the mechanics of a peer-to-peer -peer protocol, go to the Hackers and Designers website and get details for that workshop. Okay, so I would like to start trying to tie all of this stuff uh, back to the overarching topic of this evening, which is about information, how it reaches us through a network. Um, as I said, like decentralization online is not a new topic. Uh, the internet actually started out this way. And so now that we have a very centralized internet, the community has cycled in and out of interest with the idea of re-decentralizing re it for years. But I think the latest wave of interest in peer-to-peer -peer publishing and peer-to-peer -peer web browsers has very much coincided with this overall exhaustion that users are experiencing right now um, as platforms like Facebook and Google continue to kind of swallow up everything around them. So Terry Temlitz describes these types of platforms as shopping mall archives. This is a really great article that she's done on her record labels website, which is called Social Media Content Removal Fail. Um, in this piece, she describes these platforms as uh, shopping mall archives. So the vast amount of information on these networks is quite endless. Um, and so when a new body of work is like published through these services, the context of that work is very often watered down, um, allowing it to kind of just melt back into the abyss of this shopping mall. Um, platforms, I think, always have to scale up if they're to survive. Um, 
So I think platforms also encourage us as users to try and like scale up with them to consume more information, to connect with and trust other users on the network that we really know very little about. Um, I don't know if anyone else has noticed this. I've just started noting this. Um, a lot of my friends on Twitter, uh, understandably so, have actually started resetting their following counts to zero. And then they like try and smaller, uh, follow a very small handful of other people on, on Twitter whose knowledge and work that they, they value very highly. Um, I think that when there's too much information flying at you, it's really hard to contextualize all of it. Uh, and eventually you just kind of give up in exhaustion. So I see this a lot now. Um, this is fine, this is actually quite a good strategy, but I think that there is something going wrong here. So presently there's a lot of discussion about how an internet that's like reinvented on the peer-to-peer -peer web fits into all of this um, and how it's going to like solve all of the problems that platforms have created for us. Um, if we talk specifically for a moment about tonight's topic, you know, propaganda, fake news, um, although I'm not particularly qualified to like talk about these topics, I, I personally don't feel that a lot of these problems are very solvable online, um, particularly on like a decentralized internet, which we're talking about, where there's like more autonomy, less central authority, uh, less central verification of users, actually I would only expect that that madness continues to snowball. Um, I, don't th I often try not to um, shoehorn any like techno solutionist framing into these types of problems. Um, if anything, I think a, you know, a, an ideal solution would be just you know, educating folks at a very younger age to, be to better identify misinformation. But of course, like, these are very subjective realities. Um, what's real for someone in one place is, is fake for someone else somewhere else. So I think the peer-to-peer -peer web presents, what it does present is an opportunity to stop and actually rethink how we build communities of information online, um, how we better tie the act of information consumption specifically to things or places that are actually meaningful to us, which we've, we've, which we've spoken um, about earlier tonight. So I started reading this uh, book recently, which I thought was really cool. Um, I'm still reading it. It's called Organization After Social Media. There's a great quote at the end of the very first chapter. Um, what networks need to learn is how to split off or fork once they start getting too big. Scale can become the enemy. At this point, networks typically enter the danger zone of losing focus. Intelligent software can assist us to dissolve connections, close connections and delete groups, once their task is over. We should never be afraid to end the party. So I wonder if we can use some of the uh, unique properties of peer-to-peer uh, -peer web to almost like recalibrate how we form the networks that we operate within, um, how we push back against this scale problem, how we can consume information in a way that's actually better tied to the communities that we already exist within um, particularly ones as active and prolific as creative artist communities. So um, this website's called What CD. Can I ask who was a member on What CD? There's got to be some people in here. Yes, awesome. So I used to be a religiously fanatic user of this website. Um, it was a, a private torrent community that was taken offline in 2016. Um, I'm pretty sure it was one of the most like exhaustive collections of music anywhere online. Um, obviously the activity that was taking place there was breaking copyright laws like left, right and center. However, the weirdly ironic thing having now moved to Berlin and met a lot of people there who like publish music, run record labels, go on tour as a full-time job as people in Berlin do, it turns out that everyone actually used what CD. Um, that community was a very tragically informative resource for anyone who wanted to discover some of like the most craziest most obscure music that you'd ever heard of. So having worked in record shops before, the culture of music sharing on that website was on a totally different level. Um, and I think that was thanks in part to the fact that everyone was connected often to several other users on the website, usually in real life. To get access, you would have to receive an invite from someone that you knew, um, who knew that you would be able to contribute back to the network before you made it inside. Um, the fact that many people I've met who do music for a living also traded music on that website 
I think says a lot about that situation. And so after they got shut down, we now find ourselves in this weirdly confusing scenario, which I tried to sum up in a tweet. Private torrent trackers may have fueled a lot of privacy, but at least many of them built up valuable wealth of shared cultural knowledge. The popular streaming services that replaced them are akin to leech-only torrent clients, and still nobody gets paid. Um, for reference, uh, a leech-only torrent client is when you would download lots of data from a network using BitTorrent, um, but you then slow down your upload speed um, so that you don't have to share with anyone else. And this is what we call like leechy behavior. So people may see this as like a, a far stretch, um, but I see some kind of correlation between the way in which we consume data and information through these now like legal, ad-supported, like shopping mall platforms, and this kind of like top-down, relentless information pipeline that's giving everyone anxiety. So a community, and most importantly, a context around what we're consuming, why we're consuming it, um, and who we're actually consuming it with, is completely lost on those platforms. And that's what we do online feels less like knowledge sharing and just sort of like blind consumption. So um, at Trust, back in May, we held uh, this panel event with the developers of Beaker Browser. They'd, they'd flown in from overseas, and towards the end of the evening, um, we encouraged everyone to like, get out their laptops, uh, download Beaker if they hadn't already, try it out, and then try to create and publish a small website to the DAT network. Um, it was a, a pretty fun experiment. Um, one cool thing that we decided to do was to um, set up a DAT node at Trust. Um, it might be a bit hard to uh, understand what's going on here. I went a bit crazy on Instagram, but uh, on the left corner is a, a, a Raspberry Pi, which is a small computer. We loaded it up with the DAT protocol, um, and then this is an interface for pinning DAT archives, which I'll explain. So um, we set this up in the space so that when people publish their peer-to-peer -peer websites for this workshop, they could actually pin it or pin that URL or pin that peer-to-peer -peer archive to this small computer, um, and it would continue seeding their websites back out to the DAT network after they had left Trust that evening. So what we really liked about this was that there, at that particular moment, Trust was sort of acting as this like gestural digital anchor where users could like enter into the space, pin data or websites or whatever, any type of media to the peer-to-peer -peer node and then just kind of like walk away from it, uh, waiting until someone else came into the space to discover what was there. For context, everything that was seated on this was only available in the space. Um, a funny side note, the node that we actually set up got disconnected a few days later because someone decided to charge their PlayStation controller. Um, and so I tried making light of that situation. Um, the peer-to-peer -peer node slash server concept is actually an interesting phenomenon that arises from this culture because peer-to-peer -peer networks are obviously like supposed to be completely decentralized. The reality is though that the network still often requires anchors every now and again um, so that if it's absolutely necessary that a set of users reach each other, it can be done through one of these anchors. Um, but more generally, peer-to-peer -peer nodes are often just about like persisting files online. Um, the cloud is essentially this, this kind of thing. We can pin data to it and then just walk away. But specifically with that, the concept of a node is that they're very specific to one particular user or like a community of users. They shouldn't be just like catch-all servers for anyone and everyone. Um, I read a great article earlier this week about uh, shadow libraries, which some of you may be familiar with. Um, shadow libraries are these like online repositories for uh, academic research journals that haven't been made openly accessible to the public without an extortionately high royalty fee. Um, so these websites and communities essentially just pirate them, make them available online for students and researchers, uh, anyone from the public to download, because of course information should be free and accessible. There's a lot of political history behind the origin of shadow libraries, many of them being mostly inspired by like the Russian shadow libraries of the 90s. Um, but I'm very intrigued by, by this idea of taking the ethos of something like, you know, the shadow library or the private torrent tracker um, or other examples of like very contextualized online communities and then tying them to the concept of a peer-to-peer -peer node that's actually anchored within a 
uh, specific physical space. So as I mentioned before, peer-to-peer -peer networks can operate completely separately to quote unquote the internet. And I think this could be a very interesting experiment into like how a user or a community of users, uh, particularly ones that are anchored around like spaces, so like students, artists, musicians, researchers, what changes when we focus our consumptive habits through spaces and nodes that don't scale in the same way that online platforms do. When we know everyone who is uh, contributing and pinning things onto a node, when we only sync up with a new collection of data and information, say like once a day or once every couple of days when we enter into the space, like what changes as a result? Um, so one proposal that we had at Trust back in Berlin is to actually set up some formalized peer-to-peer -peer nodes at the space. Um, that are accessible to folks through their browsers when they step inside Trust, so that information and data exchange takes place as people come and go. Um, so through that, we'd expect an interesting uh, repository of like media, data, text resources, news articles, like pirated materials to grow over a long period of time. Um, but as this is a peer-to-peer -peer network, we're also wondering like, what it would mean to send nodes to collaborative spaces in like other cities, other countries, and form a peer-to-peer -peer network of information, media, knowledge, and data that's actually traded between physical spaces in different locales. Um, so in order to access the trust repository, you actually have to step into trust or one of the spaces connected with us as a node. Um, in order to access the other spaces repositories, you know, we must step into their spaces or alternatively step into trust. Um, yes, this is, a, this is a form of scaling, which I'm trying to push back against, but I think this might be scaling in a way which is uh, conceptually manageable um, and valuably, like, more contextual as well. So libraries and universities have had this, like, long culture and tradition of, like, space networking, but as many of us have grown up now preferring to uh, access and accrue information through like privatized platforms, how do we use this new wave of peer-to-peer -peer tech to experiment with different methods of access, both online and offline? Um, this idea hasn't necessarily formulated yet. We're, we're still trying to like nut this out. Um, I basically wanted to come here and talk about this to maybe spark some ideas with people here. Um, I know that there are designers and developers in the space. Um, this is still very much a sketch in my head. It's not fully fleshed out, but we're going to be playing with these ideas over the next several months at Trust back in Berlin. So if you're ever in town, like, please come and hang out with us. We're going to have several of these experiments set up very soon, and maybe you can come and hack on this particular idea with us. So thank you. We sadly have become used to. Mm -hmm. So where, um, but where do you see this going? Let's say culturally and socially. So, what, what, or maybe the other way around? From what is it, does this start from a desire, or is the is the desire outside the tech, or does this start from a desire related to tech, or also, does this also start from a social and cultural desire? Um, I think. Uh, yeah. A lot of the community that like currently harbors around this like P2P web scene at the moment, as I tried to sort of touch on in my talk, a lot of the want for this, um, unlike say a lot of like discussions you hear about like blockchain, which is all about yeah, like was, yeah, uh, very like militant autonomy mm -hmm. or money or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, for a lot of these developers and a lot of the designers in the scene, all they want is kind of just uh, a network or internet where they can just do the things right. without being interrupted, without being sold to, without being, uh, without having their data taken away from them. These are kind of like quite simple concepts and probably things we should all get. Um, but, uh, you know, as someone said earlier, like this is kind of the web 2.0 that we currently exist within. And so, a lot of the discussion of like peer-to-peer -peer web of that particular scene around DAT and Beaker, I think it, um, it's, it's a very quickly growing scene just because like people are trying to find an alternative to do their day-to-day -day things with, mm -hmm. try and find an internet that maybe they would have been on say five, 10 years ago. I'm not such a big fan of like trying to look back to like nostalgia and look back to the old web. I think that's like really fun, but it's also like, I do like looking forward. So I think it's like a mix of like, we want the things that we had 10 years ago on the web where we weren't in this shithole, but we also want to like live in the future and do really fucking cool shit with it. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. 
So how does this so how does this community grow? This means so it, the, it's the, I mean, this is always the case. This is also like back then. This was always the case. Mm -hmm. I think the same question that hackers and designers has to some extent. Like uh, there is a technical baseline amount of knowledge before you can kind of even acknowledge the kind of things that you want to do for which you would need such a system. Mm -hmm. So I mean, uh, it's a kind of chicken and egg thing. So yep. so how do you go about that? Um, if you want it to grow, or if maybe growth is not your. No, point. totally. It is actually growth was your. Uh, no, totally. We're talking. Yeah, I mean, like these these yeah. technologies still have to be uh, like worked on and developed to get to a point where it's like. Yeah. I mean, a lot of this technology at the moment is not even available on like a mobile phone. It doesn't make right. sense on those platforms yet because either phones are not um, connected or autonomous enough, or they're not powerful enough, things like this. So there's still a lot of work mm -hmm. to be done at like a, a protocol technical level. Yeah. Um, one interesting point that you bring up is like, how do you, how do you bring more people into the fold? Um, why, why? They want these things. Yeah. Totally, yeah. I yeah. think like, um, for at least growing up, like, I was interested in peer-to-peer -peer tech like a very long time ago, but prior to learning how to program and stuff like this, like, networking is like a really complex yeah. computer science. Um, and so typically, like if you wanted to get into peer-to-peer -peer programming, uh, you would, you know, you'd need to have a computer science degree, you would need to probably know a several like low-level languages, understand the entire stack. It was like a, it's like a black box. Yeah. Um, I think, or at least how I came into the scene, I'm a front-end developer by trade, so I make websites and web apps and things like this, so I write HTML and JavaScript and stuff like this. Um, the DAT protocol, interestingly enough, is actually entirely built on JavaScript. So I would actually be interested to know, like, how many people have written some JavaScript or written some sort of websites or interactive websites? Right, there's like several, there's like a few hands going up. Right, and so how many of you have ever tried programming anything to do with peer-to-peer -peer protocols before? Okay, very few hands. Um, this stack in particular, like it's, it's built by a community of developers that have like grown up building websites and that stack, that JavaScript stack specifically is like, this is what formulates the, the DAP protocol. So I think this is actually a very accessible, very interesting gateway. It might not be the solution. It might not be the thing that we all use in five or 10 years, but I would say like getting a, a more diverse, wide range of people with very, very different skills Lots of designers, for example, who do fumble around with websites a lot. Like, you can actually like jump into this shit right now and tinker around with it. Um, right. It's the type of protocol that uh, is designed for a, a coder or a designer like that. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. You had a question. Yeah. Totally. Yep. Yeah. Totally. Um, I think this is a really valid point, and I was kind of hoping that someone might bring this up because I think that, I mean, one of the reservations I have about this this kind of idea is that um, it is it's this idea that's very anchored and very specific to a very specific group of people, and that's what kind of small communities are, particularly ones that are privileged enough to have access to physical spaces where people can walk in and out freely. Like, this is actually not a particularly common thing. So the fact that we have a space like this to do this in, or we have access to trust, like that's a very privileged position to be in. And so, in a sense, like coming up with this idea of like, hey, we're gonna like make this separate internet where you can come and go, and and all these like cool hip like spaces where you can access data from. Like, there's a lot of flaws with that idea. Um, I think this idea or exploration is, as I guess maybe successfully or unsuccessfully tried to articulate, it's, it's just trying to figure out a really good way of um, pinning data or like the way that I consume data personally to um, you know, like physical places or spaces that I go in and out of every day. Um, I'm, I, I have a very specific context. I work in these types of spaces. Um, I'm very fortunate to. So, um, 
this is something that I'm trying to figure out. Like, I mean, the the the, the open like accessible uh, internet is always going to be there, and I'm certainly not suggesting that like things should be more closed or like hidden away. Like, information should be like um, open and accessible to everyone. This is why we have things like shadow libraries, and I think they're really cool. Um, this is once again, it's it's just a, a thought bubble into how I might figure out maybe how to consume less or maybe just sort of, yeah, contextualize or give more meaning to like the things that I'm consuming each day. Um, the thing that I've noticed with Trust, like we have this discussion group, most of it takes place on Telegram. Um, we send a lot of things back and forth to each other every day because we're all working in different types of spaces. I actually consume a lot of my information through that. Um, I trust these people, I really respect what they do and who they are and I value their opinions. And so I'm sort of trying to tap into this thing of like, how can I tap into that network and make it some sort of infrastructure that also like links other people in the space, maybe links other spaces in other cities together. It's a thought bubble. I would definitely say that my biggest concern about the peer-to-peer -peer web being um, uh, like commercialized or privatized is pretty real. Um, the thing about Beaker Browser which is the peer-to-peer the -peer web browser that I was talking about before. Um, I think the most impressive thing about that program isn't actually the peer-to-peer -peer protocol that it runs on top of. Um, there's lots of different ways to like distribute websites and files in a, on a peer-to-peer -peer network. It's actually the fact that they've paired like publishing tools and um, made the entry point into like creating a website, getting text on the page, changing it, putting what you want on it, really super easy. And so once you pair that, those tool sets, with a peer-to-peer -peer protocol, like that's a really killer combination. The problem is, is that we have this internet where most of us use browsers from like three or four different browser vendors, and these are all run by really big corporations. Um, Mozilla, who make the Firefox browser, like they're trying to, um, they're working on several initiatives to actually embed all of these like peer-to-peer -peer protocols into their browser, but that's only like one very specific component of it. Um, as I said, the killer feature about Beaker is like, it's actually easier to publish something through that than it is on Medium. They give you all this tooling, um, uh, and I think that like, when all browsers start supporting these protocols, how do they differ in the way that like the tools that they give you? What do they allow you to do? What do they not allow you to do? Um, getting these vendors or these big companies and essentially platforms to support these peer-to-peer -peer protocols is like one specific part of that. But it's like, what do they then let you do and not do in their browsers is still a completely different problem. Um, there was also like one other thing, I've, I've had a conversation with someone who's like, hey, we should like get into some hardware manufacturing, make these really like interesting, fun peer-to-peer -peer nodes and like print them up and distribute them. And it's like, okay, like, what stops a company like Amazon like co-opting co that idea, making them themselves, and then just shipping millions of them, and then capturing that market? Yeah, that's something that I like worry about all the time, and I'm not I'm not sure if that's a a, a solvable problem because I actually do believe that like platforms and big companies like that will have the power to do that. So I'm not really sure how to solve that problem. Um, that, does that, you, that does not mean you still also. Uh, have the power to do the same. I mean, it just means something co-ops here, but it doesn't mean it doesn't stop you from doing, keep on doing these things. That's right. But the yeah. idea is that, like, I'm a developer and I'm, like, I understand a lot of technical concepts, so I might be able to do that, right. but, okay. like, yes. I'm not the yeah. important person yeah. in this conversation. Talk about this scaling, indeed. Totally, yeah. To get other people Do you want to ask a question? It's not a shadow, it's a question. Okay. Yeah. Um, can you talk more about the relationship between and trust? Yep. As in, like, uh, like the concept of trust or trust the space? Totally. Um, so with Beaker Browser, um, maybe, is this, I might have just, um, I know you're all super restless and I'm really sorry, but I think this would be something just quickly to go back to. Um, yep. Totally. Mm -hmm. of, to be there, to trust, um, to know them, to trust them, to be there, to, to, to anchor it. 
You're right. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, to clarify, like, trust is not a company. It's just a, a loose collective of, like, collective. people hanging out in a space, working, you know, we, we work in, like, peer-to-peer uh, -peer stuff, blockchain stuff, design, this sort of thing. Um, I read that there's a comment on the blockchain logic, of course. Like, so, trustless, no, no, sorry, sorry, we go back to trust. trust. Yes, yeah, sorry. So, sorry, can I just ask you again, can you, can you maybe resummarize the original question that you have? It's sort of... Totally. Yep. Okay, cool. I think this is actually kind of uh, very relevant to the conversations we've been having tonight uh, and this overarching topic of propaganda, fake news. Um, when I say that like peer-to-peer -peer networks are really not the solution for this type of stuff, this is exactly what I'm talking about. Because if everything is a file, everything is a file system, um, with a file system you have to be able to copy and fork and duplicate and modify it. That's what free software is all about. Um, so this, for a real peer-to-peer -peer internet to exist, you have to be able to do this. And browsers have to give users the option to do this. But of course, like, what this then means is that if I want to go and fork the MetaHaven website, and then, oh, right, okay, bad example. Really sorry, sorry. If I wanted to, yeah. Actually, no, let's make a better example. Let's say I wanted to fork the hackers and designers website and maybe put on some shadow event somewhere else with some different details and get everyone somehow to another space. I mean, that is really quite easy doing this. I mean, obviously, um, these uh, websites are posted at different locations. And if you like, um, I think this is where like identity and verification and as you say, like trust comes into this thing. Um, and this is where the peer-to-peer -peer web becomes really complex because there's actually no concept of identity on there. This is why we have platforms like Facebook or Twitter, even though we all fucking hate them, we still trust them that they will somewhat verify who we're talking to. Um, you know, generally, generally if we click onto someone who we expect they have like 2,000 followers and our friends are following them, we go, okay, that's probably them. And so anything that gets posted on their feed is probably going to be from them. But then when you get like lots of bots, lots of trolls, like lots of fake accounts that are posting like forked peer-to-peer -peer links, then no one really knows the difference because as you might be able to see like, or have seen previously, like a lot of these peer-to-peer -peer website URLs are actually hashes, which are like really complex strings of characters and numbers. I mean, yeah, like the dog's out the bag at that point. Like who knows which hash is different to the other hash. And this is where you start having to build like complex identification and trust systems. Um, so I think like this idea about being in a space with people that you do trust um, and so that you can kind of like verify and trust the, the documents and data that's coming from them and that you think you should be reading those or like trusting what they send you. like. That's one way to fight it. It's definitely not a scalable option. And it's kind of like this really old school, old web kind of thing. But um, yeah, uh, the peer-to-peer -peer web is really complex for exactly this, this problem. Um, there are a lot of blockchain companies like trying to solve like identity verification and like, um, but I don't really believe that any of them are gonna solve that problem anytime soon, so. Yeah, I'm not sure how to, <laughs> to round that question out. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um, before we run to the bar, and uh, after we thank Louis Center. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yes, sorry, just really quickly, I want to thank all the speakers, of course, to, uh, to come here and, and trust us as a really like non-institutional organization, um, sending out Facebook messages, um, hey, can you come join us? So uh, <laughs> um, that's really great. I have a gift for, for each of you, a, a kind of a goodie bag. It consists of a, a tote bag designed by Goyce and Birls, of which uh, Juliet is part of and also Florian. Um, all the design is done by them. Um, and it consists of a, a, a book that we made last year. Um, no, actually this year, 
the content is um, uh, it's, it's a documentation of all our activities of last year and we were investigating um, possibilities, means of going on and off the grid. So it's uh, kind of related also to what you were talking about, like how can we build uh, practices that are maybe self-sustaining or um, less dependent on existing uh, grids and infrastructures. So that's in there. It's um, this book for those who are interested is also on sale uh, at San Serif here in Amsterdam and it's printed with conductive ink. So you can uh, make controllers with it, uh, for instance, as to uh, design uh, books with, as we did with this uh, publication, uh, which I did together with Juliette. Um, I want to thank the space very much, Fanfare, to host us here. It was very, very warm and uh, really perfect location. <laughs> thank you so much. And, um, and of course the Hackers and Designers crew, uh, Vincent, uh, who helped us with producing the public event, Juliette helping with uh, documentation, Isabel helping to produce the workshops, and uh, Salbi, James, and Herko. Did I forget anyone? No, I don't think so. Thank you so much, everyone. And this is going to be great, because this is actually only the start. And we're going to finish um, the Hackson Designer Summer Academy with um, uh, also a public event at Butcher's Tears on 2nd of August. going to be less formal, uh, more the party mode uh, barbecue. But there will be an open stage for all the participants to present whatever they think is important. Um, yes, that was it. Uh, thank you so much, and we'll uh, have 15 more minutes to drink a beer and then leave the, the premises. <laughs>